And welcome to another edition of Hank Unplugged. This is the podcast, not the broadcast. It takes you out of the studio, into the study, as it were, for conversations with people who have made a real difference with their lives. They're interesting people, people that are intelligent, that have a lot to offer, not only in their own fields of expertise, but also in the area of apologetics, which is one of the core values of the Christian Research Institute, the Bible Answer Man broadcast, and our outreaches around the world. Today, I have a guest who has almost become family in the sense that he has written so many articles over so many years for the Christian Research Journal. Not only that, I've had him on the Bible Answer Man broadcast. I'm talking about Dr. Richard Poupard, who's an oral surgeon, but he has an interesting distinction. He also has a master's in Christian apologetics. And Richard, it is great to have you on the show. Oh, it's such an honor to be here. Thanks. Thanks so much for inviting me. This is a little different than what we've done before on the broadcast, but we've talked about so many subjects. You've written on the ethics of modern board and card games. You've written about whether or not we should continue to use the term sexual purity, uh, postmodern death, which has to do with organ transplantation and human value, modesty, objectivism, and human value, another very important issue that I want to talk about today. Uh, Should Christians fear profanities, miracle marijuana, medical marijuana, I should say, Uh, is birth control unbiblical, compassionate adoption for the most helpless, self-esteem from a scalpel, this having to do with the ethics of plastic surgery, and much, much more. Again, it's just great to have you on this podcast. I want to talk about This issue of board games, I just think it's kind of interesting that you would write an article on the ethics of modern board games, as well as modern card games. And you make some pretty interesting remarks in that article, particularly in that we no longer oftentimes have the opportunity to sit together for dinner or lunch as families in a hectic busy world, but these board games, these card games can really allow us to interact in a way that sometimes we just don't do anymore. Yeah, today now, nowadays with kids, and I, I have children ranging from 8 to, to 15, that, you know, oftentimes they're staring down at their phones and they seem occupied. And at least in our family, and I've been involved in, in board gaming for the, the last 15 years, it is actually a time in which we all can interact as one and interact together and to, to really uh, be able to open our home to others who come in. And, you know, the genesis of that article began because um, there's a, just right now we're at a, a, just almost a renaissance of board and card gaming in which uh, there's so many different new games coming out, and they're so much more interesting, frankly, than the ones that, uh, that we're, we were used to, at least when I grew up. And the question is, is that, you know, there's, there's an advantage, of course, that we can all sit around and enjoy these games. But, you know, what about the, the topics of these games? Are they, are they reasonable? Um, are, they, are they certainly edifying as Christians? Should, are there are certain things we should stay away from. Um, and in terms of in, investigating that, I just found it interesting in that um, we have to balance that wonderful family time uh, with, uh, you know, some, some topics and some types of themes that can be considered or have been considered in the past very dangerous. And at least for us, I mean, we, I used to take a very conservative, extremely conservative uh, stance on types of themes. But in looking at them a little bit more thoroughly, um, I, I found that it was more, these, these games were more a matter of uh, using thematic elements to uh, simply progress some kind of game mechanic that, frankly, was very interesting. Um, so that's where that, 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 that genesis of that, that article came from. But I do think it's uh, this new upsurge in board and card games that you can do with families and friends as opposed to staring at a screen is, is in general, a very, very positive thing. What I find interesting about what you just said is that you had one position at one time, you have another position now, which means that you've gone through 
a change in your point of view. Uh, how important is it for us to progress in that way? Uh, in other words, to continue to open our minds uh, to learning, to test all things in light of Scripture, obviously, to hold fast to that which is good, but not to be so closed-minded that we come to a particular position, we repeat it over and over again, it becomes a mantra for us, and we're never open to learning the other side of the story. Oh, I, I think being a lifelong learner is so very important. And it's, when, whenever, when we're talking about anyone's faith and our, our faith history, and all of our stories are different, uh, it, I think it is very important that we sometimes take things that we have been taught and truly line them up with what is in Scripture and to see, because there's always some traditions that are laid down that might be handed to us in, in, in a way that might not actually be biblical. Um, and that's actually um, what I try to do about a lot of these different types of topics. And we have the biblical truth. We have uh, things that are very clear. And then we have that application of those biblical truths to life. Um, and it's important for us as we, as we go on to apply the biblical principles, but also to evaluate some of the things that we have been, been, been taught. Um, you know, in terms of even, even games, the idea of anything that's that is, uh, you know, I, I, I come from a faith tradition, which a lot of the people that I've attended church with don't play face cards because of possible demonic, demonic elements. Um, and that's their conviction, that's fine, but it's reasonable, I think, to assess those types of things. And yes, be willing to learn, be willing to, uh, to, to, to grow, and to not simply be stuck exactly where we're at. So you're a doctor, you're a surgeon, but you also have this incredible interest and acumen when it comes to apologetics. I'm kind of interested in how all of that works. I mean, how did you get this passion for apologetics? To be honest with you, I, after I, I began my, my career um, and I, I became a Christian, uh, I really was interested in, in, in using both the emotional as well as the, the rational parts of me in order to, to, to continue to grow. I've always been curious. I've always been questioning. And um, I found the, the field of apologetics after that. And then um, I decided to uh, pursue a master's degree as a disciplinary matter. Uh, when you're pursuing a degree, you read things that you otherwise may not be too excited about reading. Um, and, and that way you continue to, to grow and to integrate the thinking part of your brain with, uh, with it's actually a false dichotomy, but you know, both the rational thinking part of your faith as well as uh, the, the, the spiritual, more emotionally, emotional part. And it's important, I think, to have both. So as I continued on with my career, um, it, it was always important to look at different topics that come up, both in our culture as well as a lot of the, the bioethical issues that come up with our day in order to apply the Christian worldview um, in a way that makes sense to others. Um, I, I think that apologetics doesn't bring you all the way. It's very important for us to maintain mystery and realizing that we are not going to uh, have full knowledge of these things. But also it gives us tools in order to, to really um, be able to evaluate things. You know, one, one last quick thing about of that, I, it's amazed me that and even in terms of my apologetic studies, there's always a fear that I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, read a book by a new atheist, for instance, and thinking, wow, this is, really, uh, this is really convincing and really challenging my faith. And surprisingly, I have found the Christian faith so much more rational, and so much, uh, the arguments are so much stronger for Christian faith than reading uh, any of these bigwigs uh, with, you know, with, with Richard Dawkins or um, all, all the other new atheists that it, you realize once you really confront it that, they don't, that the arguments are not very good after all. You know what I love that you just touched on is the fact that apologetics is important in terms of always being ready to give an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within you. But you also pointed out that there's a place for mystery in the Christian faith. And I fear that, particularly in the West, we have this snarling logicality that doesn't allow for mystery. So we try to explain everything, and there's certain things that are simply inexplicable, unless, of course, your God is too small. Yeah, absolutely. 
when there are certain theological concepts that it's, it, it, we somehow have this dichotomy where we either have to take it by faith and never question it, or that we have to have all the information to be able to dot all the I's and cross all the T's and make their no, you know, we, we, we know everything about that. And truth of the matter is, it's somewhere in between those two. Um, that, that it's okay, and God made us in order to question certain things and certain concepts. But at the same time, the idea that we need so much proof and so much evidence that we can never get to the point that there, there's, there's no realm for mystery. God is so much bigger than, than, than we even know him to be. Um, and that's, that's exciting to me. That's something that is not a challenge to my faith. That's something that, that affirms the belief that I have. What caused you to embrace the historic Christian faith? Well, to be honest with you, it was a, um, a mixture of, of both uh, looking at uh, the Christian worldview and seeing it line up best with uh, the way the world as it really is. It makes the most sense of things. Um, in, in terms of my, my own faith, I grew up with a, in a Roman Catholic tradition, and didn't really understand a lot of the things, um, a lot of the, the concepts uh, that I, I learned later. Um, ironically, now I look back on my Roman Catholic, and I've learned a lot more about that, the, the theology I supposedly used to have, um, and become greatly respectful of that also. But it's just a matter of, of over a period of time, in some ways, resisting the idea of faith, but then coming to the conclusion that this is the best explainer for the life the way that it truly is. It's not merely a matter of giving life life meaning, but it's also, it, it corresponds best to what reality is and what morality is, despite the fact that sometimes we don't want to apply it that way. You sort of alluded to this in an earlier comment. Apologetics is the handmaiden to evangelism, which is to say that it is a door opener. You have a well-reasoned answer to a question, and it opens the door to communicating the truth and grace and life that only Jesus Christ can bring to the human heart. But oftentimes with apologetics, you have people who want to win arguments, and they become proud. Once they learn the apologetic arguments, it's sort of like they have a hammer and everything looks like a nail. Uh, they want to beat people with their arguments. They want to win arguments. But this is really not the purpose of apologetics. Absolutely not. I mean, obviously, we want to have good arguments. Uh, we would rather convince somebody with good and true arguments than with bad arguments. But we also have to realize that we are always talking to someone who is uh, intrinsically valuable, made in the image of God, and to be respectful of them. And as we look back on our own faith journeys, we realize that it's, that it's rare, I think, that we hear the Christian worldview presented one time, and we instantaneously realize how rational it is, and then we just jump right in. Most often time, it is a process, and it's a complex one. It's an individual one, but one that we go through. So I think in order, we, it's, it's always important for us to love each other and to, to love those who are we, we are trying to reach, not just with winning an argument over them, but also by, by showing them that, that the love that, that Christ has shown to us. Um, and we always have to keep that in, in, in balance, because winning an argument and then you know, having the person walk away because you simply were, uh, you know, uh, showed yourself, or at least acted like you were intellectually above them, is the exact opposite of what we wanted to portray, and more importantly, the exact opposite of what Christ was. You've written so many wonderful articles for the Christian Research Journal, and those that are listening in to this podcast can go to equip.org and find those articles on the web. Again, at equip.org, one of the really interesting articles that I read or reread the other day was an article on medical marijuana. And you pose the question as to whether this is a miracle drug or whether it's spiritual poison. And I think that's a, an incredibly important subject for a lot of reasons, partly because medical marijuana and recreational marijuana are now morphing into one in many states within our country. 
Yeah, well, absolutely, and that's actually one of the the really the, the real challenges to the acceptance of medical marijuana. The difference between a therapeutic use of a medication and a recreational use of a medication is clear for almost everything else. I mean, for anesthesia, for instance, we use medication called fentanyl very commonly. And yet we know also there is an opioid crisis in this nation um, because of medications like fentanyl. So therapeutic use is understandable and, and is good, and in fact it mitigates the effects of sin in our world. Um, but there's a huge difference between that and the recreational use and the, damages that, the damage that occurs because of that. But marijuana, however, and it's mostly, I think, been, been a, a planned um, strategic uh, policy to really push this idea of medical marijuana in order to increase the acceptance of the recreational use of marijuana. And it's been incredibly effective um, that as, as more and more states go uh, accept medical marijuana, um, that what it does is increases significantly the access that virtually everybody has to marijuana. Um, the recreational use certainly, certainly goes up significantly, even in the states where it remains illegal. And then it comes to the point that when, uh, uh, when it comes up to a vote for recreational use of marijuana, um, it's more frequently accepted. Um, as, a, as a moral issue, it's, it's fascinating that uh, as far as a cultural issue, this, the acceptance of marijuana has changed significantly even in the last generation. In previous generations, a, a large majority of Americans thought that it was immoral uh, to smoke marijuana, where now we're at a point in which the majority of Americans think it's actually not immoral uh, to smoke marijuana recreationally. So, and it's been a part of that change has been the general acceptance of medical marijuana. Maybe without getting too deeply into the subject, it'd be important to let our listeners know about some of the psychophysical problems associated with marijuana, including diminished cognitive function, memory impairment, and many other psychophysical problems. Yeah, there certainly is. There's a, you know, both physical aspects of taking marijuana as well as some, some spiritual aspects of, of, of marijuana use. Physically, a lot of these are not even known, but as studies continue to come out, we realize that short-term memory loss has been significant in those who've undergone marijuana. There are some changes in the brain that can be seen through modern imaging techniques for those that are chronic smokers of marijuana. Um, and the idea of marijuana itself is, is an unregulated natural quote-unquote medication um, that people smoke it in order to get its effect as fast as possible, and you titrate the effect. So basically, you just take as much as you want to become a certain effect. There is a tolerance that does build up over time also. So in order to get the same effect, you've got to smoke a little bit more. Um, and also, there's really no indication that there's a non-intoxicating dose of marijuana, that essentially people who, who, who smoke marijuana do it to the point that they feel a certain way that they want to and and and. and instead of taking a regular dose, does that for themselves. So um, that certainly is, is, is problematic. And as we learn more, um, we have this uh, you know, almost a virtual experiment going on with now millions of people with more access to marijuana. And I think we're going we're gonna to find even more uh, negative physical effects that will uh, occur because of that. Can the active ingredient THC, can it be pharmaceutically regulated in order to be effective? It actually can in many ways. There's, there's two. Uh, this THC is a psychoactive uh, ingredient in marijuana. There's also CBD, which is also involved in marijuana. And uh, CBD has actually been isolated. You can get oil with, with CBD in it. And that's been effective in some ways to, uh, to treat some illnesses like chronic seizures and the like. Um, but THC is, is the, the psychoactive element. And um, there are means to, uh, to isolate it and to give it as a, as a controlled dose, but the, the effective dose or therapeutic dose hasn't really been found yet. Uh, as a rule, I actually I do support the idea of continuing to research all, all possible uh, medications that can be helpful to treat illnesses. Um, but to do so like we do all the other medications, where it's well-regulated, it's well-controlled, and we, we simply don't assume that it's some wonderful, harmless, innocuous medication because it, it, it grows from the ground. And I think that's where, that's where a lot of, a lot of uh, people have, have the medical marijuana issue wrong. And a lot of people will say, look, it's no different whatsoever than 
having a glass of wine. A lot of Christians used to frown on having a glass of red wine. And in the same way, they're frowning on having a bit of marijuana. But you're pointing out in your article that there are some pretty significant distinctions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, marijuana is, is specifically a psychoactive medication. That, um, that alcohol is a depressant medication, certainly has effects, especially when, uh, when consumed to intoxication. But the entire point of smoking marijuana is to have a psychoactive effect. Um, and it's oftentimes been described as having a, a, more of an enlightenment, increasing your creative, uh, your creativity. Um, and actually, uh, it's been frequently used in Eastern religions even uh, to, to claim that you would cleanse your body of sin from consuming, uh, consuming cannabis, consuming marijuana. So there certainly is a, a, a spiritual danger um, to this. Uh, when we're under, when you're t- undergoing something that those in Eastern religions do in order to feel closer to God and to feel like your sins are being uh, are, are being cleansed away from you, um, I think there's danger in that. We realize that there's really only one way uh, that there's that's only only one way uh, to have our sins forgiven. That's that's through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and to replace that with a chemical which inherently changes brain chemistry is very concerning. Yes, it is. And, you know, I want to turn a corner here. You've written so many articles that are of great interest to me, and I've read every one of them carefully over the years. One of the issues that I probably have no right talking about whatsoever, but perhaps you do, is the issue of birth control. I mean, the reason I have no right to talk about this is I have 12 children. But um, you wrote an article, Is Birth Control Unbiblical? And one of the points that I remember that you made in that article is that contraceptive use has morphed from individual choice to government-mandated right in that it at least it allegedly reduces poverty, it supposedly improves a person's health, it promotes things like gender equality, and the list goes on. Talk about how this morphing has taken place and the, the dangers inherent in the morphing. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, obviously, historically, when, when oral contraception was, was first invented in the 60s, um, it was presented as a woman having the right to control her fertility, control what happens in her body. And it was certainly elective, and she would choose to, to, uh, to take this medication if that's what she wishes. But after, um, with, with Obamacare and the difference of, of, of insurance mandating that every insurance covers contraception, um, it's now seen as, as a, a, a right for a woman to, that, that this is it's for her good health, to be able to change how her reproductive system works. And ironically, what this means essentially is that we normally uh, mandate these types of medications that treat some form of illness. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm a diabetic, so when I have insulin, um, that, that I, I use insulin to treat something that's going wrong in my body. Um, and for the first time, we are now equating uh, a woman's reproductive system working exactly how God has designed it as a pathology, something that we have to try to fix by making it malfunction in order for them to enjoy a full and complete life. And that is a, that's an a interesting philosophical change that I don't think we've understood the full ramifications of yet. The idea that you know, a, a, a woman's reproductive system working correctly is a problem that we have to fix is, is, is problematic in a number of ways. Um, and I think even the idea of how we view childbirth, how we view the idea of, of conceiving children, it changes significantly. And by the way, Hank, just so you understand, too, I, I have five children of my own, so you know, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I may not be the best one to speak on the the the, the wonders of contraception either for that reason. Uh, as an ill-fated attempt at a joke on my part. <laughs> <laughs> but look, yeah, I mean, you're touching on this. The burden of children is a syndrome today. The syndrome biblically used to be the burden of barrenness. So the difference between children seen as a burden and a blight or a blessing from God. Oh, it's a significant difference. I found this out. I used to teach an adult Sunday school class of young married couples. 
And there was just a general assumption that this was what their life was going to be. You become married, then you take contraception for a number of years until you finally feel ready to bear the burden of having children. And this is, this is a little simplistic thinking, too, um, because we do know having children is, is difficult and, and it does have burdens. Um, at the same time, you know, it's almost, I, I equate it to almost like preparing for elective surgery. You want to make sure that everything's ready, that you kind of like get yourself all set for this thing that you are about to endure. And that's a significant change culturally from the way children used to be seen. Um, nowadays, you know, the, the idea of almost thinking that we have a right to have children exactly when we want them, when we feel we're ready, and to undergo the, this horrible burden, as opposed to seeing them as most of us see them after, uh, after, after we're uh, raising them as, as tremendous blessings and challenges, of course. But, you know, biblically, the Bible made it very clear that, yes, infertility was the challenge. And there's, there's a lot of, I, I, I tend to think a lot of these issues is, is we have cultural cognitive dissonance about a lot of things. And the concept that now when we're very young that we choose to contracept and then we want to have children when we're a little bit older at a time that our bodies have find it more difficult and then we spend you know, billions of dollars in infertility treatments is really an interesting juxtaposition that we didn't have in the past. It's kind of interesting to me from a practical standpoint. I mean, I think back to the early days uh, thinking, how in the world am I going to be able to support another child? And then Kathy would tell me I'm pregnant again. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then I'd wonder, how are we going to be able to support that? But the point I guess I'm driving at is this really does, in many ways, become a trust issue. Because if I look back now, I think there is no way in the world that I could have figured this out on my own, but somehow or other, the trust factor was most important because every single time I took a step of faith, every time we had a child, God provided in some way that I would never have anticipated, I couldn't have dreamed of, I couldn't have conjured it up in my mind, and yet God provided. That story is so common, too. Um, it, it, is, it is very true that the, I think all of us as parents, it's a ubiquity thought that we have no idea how we did this and no idea how we keep doing this, that there's one thing that shows us our dependence on God and His grace and His mercy for us. It's the concept of raising children. And I don't want to over-romanticize it, because I do know that, that having children is not easy, um, and the idea that it's just all going to be wonderful. But I think virtually every one of us who understands the value of kids and have undergone this ourselves, um, uh, understand that it, what it, uh, an amazing uh, illustration of God's love and grace to us as we went through these, uh, through having children, and dependent on Him and His grace for getting us through all of those times. And the, uh, the amount of blessings that comes from that, it, it's hard to, eat to, to, to underestimate them. Yeah, and then when you get a little older and you can start traveling with your kids and uh, hanging out with your kids, they, uh, uh, they change from being your kids to being your friends. I mean, there's a huge, huge payoff at the end. Yeah, and, and, and that, that payoff is something that our, our culture and society doesn't understand anymore. And I would hope, and one of the purposes of writing that article is that we would at least be able to uh, reevaluate our attitudes in the church and say, should we be following the culture in this manner? Or should we maybe think there is something different? Let's think about this maybe on a more global basis. If you, if you look at what's happening in the EU countries, and certainly happening in America as well, I could probably say all of North America, uh, the birth rate is far lower than the death rate. So native populations are dying out. And this is a huge demographic problem, particularly with the advent of militant Islam. So in the EU countries, you have native populations diminishing for all kinds of reasons. I mean, birth control is one of the reasons, but euthanasia, abortion, gender fluidity, same-sex sexuality. I mean, a lot of reasons Europeans are self-aborting. Rushing in to fill the vacuum are millions of polygamous Muslims that have no 
intention of assimilating into Western democratic societies. And so there's a huge, huge problem to Christians not having, having children. Yeah, well, especially when we're now to the point that many countries, even Russia and, and in some of the EU countries, are trying to encourage their populations to have more children. Um, we now are reaping what we've sown in the previous generations. Uh, when we see fertility as a problem that we need to solve in order to live our lives uh, simply the way that we want to live them, these are the type of things that can happen. And uh, when we're not uh, replacing ourselves, and we actually have to now encourage to do exactly the opposite of the thing that we discouraged a generation ago, these are the types of things that we see. You've written so many interesting articles. Again, those articles available on the web at equip.org, another one titled Compassionate Adoption for the Most Helpless. This is one that really touched my heart, and perhaps I'll explain that in a few moments, but I love this article because this article, as it were, uh, took on flesh for me. But before I get into that, talk about the ghastly consequences of experimentation on embryos. Well, basically... When we're talking about embryonic stem cell research, we're taking human embryos that have been created, and instead of implanting them and placing them in an environment where they can develop and grow, we simply use them for, for spare body parts, for spare cells, in order to, uh, to supposedly treat a, a, a myriad of diseases. It is interesting that since, um, since Obama, President Obama opened up the, the floodgates to uh, embryonic stem cell research. Um, there was all the promises of all these diseases that would be cured. There hasn't really been even one human trial okayed using embryonic stem cells. We just as a culture wanted the right to try to, to, to play with them to see whether, whether they could be, be useful to us. And as, as many of, of, the, uh, of the concepts that I, that I try to deal with, it's all on how we evaluate and value human life. Um, when we see human embryos, which are scientifically, unquestionably, individual human beings um, at a very early stage of development and cease to see them as valuable, but instead see them merely as, as something that we can use, uh, that's very problematic. Um, it's also one of the ironies of, of a lot of some of the medical technologies that we have. Um, it, in terms of in vitro fertilization, uh, you know, it's, it's a challenging thing to talk about because it's so frequent that we pro each and every one of us probably know someone who has been conceived or know a couple who's conceived their child through in vitro fertilization. Um, but at the same time, the, the way that we do in vitro today um, classically leave, they, 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 they harvest as many eggs, human eggs as possible. They try to fertilize as many as possible far more than a woman can carry at one time, and they take the leftovers and they freeze them. So there's an ethical question on what we should do with those that are in a state um, of they are hum living human beings, but they're presently, you know, sitting in a, in a freezer somewhere. Yeah, and that's really what I wanted to get at is the frozen embryos. I mean, I actually held a frozen embryo. Uh, it was known as snowflake number 94, but for me, that snowflake number 94 was a little girl named Elise. And Elise was adopted. The snowflake number 94 came in the mail. And by the time I met Elise, she was already a cute little girl. And her parents recognized that this frozen embryo was a human being, created the image and likeness of God, adopted the embryo, and today this is an absolutely extraordinary little girl. She's been in my studio. I've been in their home. I've gotten to know her very, very well, and I have a little picture of her in my office as a remembrance of the very thing you wrote about. Yep, that is fantastic. And to know that these embryos that have been left over because of how we, we do in vitro fertilization that there are that we should be considering ways in which we can treat them as the human beings that they are, and it should question ourselves that you know how should we value human beings? Um, should we should we do so only when they're when when we can see them, or can we or when we can see them and interact with them, or those that are the most vulnerable? How should we treat them? 
And I think being able to adopt an embryo to a couple that, that, uh, uh, that is looking to have children is, is just a fantastic, uh, fa- fantastic concept and idea. What's your idea with respect to Christians using in vitro fertilization? It's a great question. It's a little complex, but he, I don't think I, I don't think that using in vitro fertilization itself is is uh, morally prohibited. But I think for Christians who are considering that, there's two things that I recommend. First of all, couples should have a very frank and honest and open discussion about the concept of fertility. We seem to think that having a child and being in, in being fertile is something that that we have a right to be. And for some couples, it, it's horrible. And it's very devastating when they find out that they that they they cannot have children of their of, of their own that way, um, and it's very very challenging. So I think that should be a, a conversation that happens early. To be honest, me and my wife we we thought uh, me and my wife Deb we thought we were going to have trouble having children because of some medical issues with her. So we had talked about it beforehand exactly how far we were we were willing to go. And for those that do want to investigate in, in vitro fertilization, it's important to do so in a way. That I think decreases the chance to have um, embryos that are that are not going to be attempted to be implanted. Um, in doing so, that most in vitro clinics actually do everything they can to increase the chance of having an embryo implanted, and in doing so, they fertilize a lot of eggs, have a lot of unwanted embryos. Um, as a Christian, I think we have an obligation to at least approach the clinic to find out exactly how many embryos are you planning on fertilizing, or are you planning on, on, on creating. Um, and here's the plan that we have for uh, trying to implant them and to have a means to maybe donate the other ones for other couples that, that, uh, that are able to carry them. Uh, I, I think that was the, 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 the most ethical way of approaching that topic. There's one other question I have in this regard, and I want to move on, but it has to do with human cloning. Is that a concept that can be harmonized with a Christian worldview from your point of view? I, I do not believe so, for, for a number of reasons. Um, human cloning is done is simply as a means to, uh, to, to create more embryos and more stem cells from those embryos. Uh, it is a way to, to do so um, without undergoing additional uh, fertilizing, uh, fertilizing human eggs. Um, and in that way, in and of itself, is, is unethical. The cloned, the, the, the cloned human embryos themselves, there's very little, uh, uh, because of the way the complexity of, of a human body, there's very little chance that a cloned embryo will have an opportunity to develop past a certain stage of development. So essentially, we are making what is undeniably an individual human being that we know cannot go past a certain stage of development just in order to experiment on their cells. And I think there's, it should be very clear, there's so many ways in which that is simply wrong. Let's move into another area. You have covered a wide range of apologetic issues. I was fascinated by an article you wrote some time ago titled, Should We Continue to Use the Term Sexual Purity? Fascinated in the sense that it has become sort of standard orthodoxy that this sexual purity movement in churches is a very, very good thing. It's been lauded, it's been touted, it's been marketed, but you hold that there are liabilities to even using the term sexual purity. Uh, This can end up being uh, sort of like a relational prosperity gospel. In in many ways, yes. Um, I want to make it very clear that I do hold to a a biblical standard of, of sexuality. Um, I think that uh, sexuality should be expressed within the bonds of a covenant marriage, which means abstinence before marriage and complete sexual fidelity within marriage is, is, is essential uh, as part of the Christian worldview. Um, but we basically use this term sexual purity as a means, as a way, uh, with good intentions, to uh, take the idea of sexual abstinence and turn it more positively um, to, to, to this idea of sexual purity. And what, what, what has happened with the overuse of that term, and more importantly, even the overuse of the metaphors used to support that term, is that we, in our, in our goal to uh, support and encourage the Christian sexual ethic, 
uh, we've had some untorn consequences. Uh, when we use the word purity itself, um, there's been some studies that show that once something is seen as unpure, that it's very difficult for us to ever see it as being pure again. Some uh, interesting experiment that was done, they placed cockroaches and they, they had people drink tap water. And they put a cockroach in the water and they took the cockroach out and then put the water through a purifier in which all of the impurities were removed and then offered that same glass of water to somebody and they won't take it. Even though the water was clearer and more pure than the first, than tap water, it's the idea of something being made unpure makes it so that it's almost a disgust reaction. So the idea that we're able to, um, that, that we see human beings who have failed in this way as, some, as unpure and can never regain purity is really, is really tragic and has some, some significant consequences in terms of uh, how sexual intimacy is in marriage. And, and one point that you brought up that I think is very important is we teach young people that if they maintain their sexual purity, and by that essentially not engaging in, in premarital sexuality, um, when they're single, that when they're married, they're going to have just an incredible, intimate, fulfilling, wonderful marriage and sexual intimate life. And I think there's really reasons to question that for a number of reasons. Um, sexual intimacy is something that has developed over time. It takes hard work. It takes commitment from two people, which is why God designed it to be in marriage. And we talked about mystery uh, earlier, but uh, there's something, there's many things not as mysterious as, as the, the amazing blessings that we have when we have an incredibly uh, very vulnerable, intimate relationship with our spouse. Um, but the idea, I think we're giving some kids some false hope that as long as they keep themselves sexually pure and, and don't follow the culture, that when they become married, they can then turn the switch on and then all of a sudden they're going to have an incredibly fulfilled uh, intimate life. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, many couples struggle through some issues, especially the first few years of marriage. And if we give them promises uh, that if they do certain behaviors and they're going to get this payout and that payout isn't there in the end, that can cause them to question their faith and certainly question their commitment that, that they had uh, maintained previously. An incredibly important article from my standpoint, reading through it and reading through it again. And what you've just said, I mean, we can tend to over-romanticize sexual purity such that if we were able to maintain that to whatever degree fits within the parameters of that particular moniker, then as you point out, you know, you'd think that, wow, we're going to really be able to enjoy sex and intimacy with our spouse at a level that you couldn't have Otherwise, on the other hand, as you point out, I and mean, there's a sense in which if someone has been married before or someone's been violated in some way, the stigmata becomes damaged goods. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, you know, the, uh, one thing that has surprised me in my studies is the, the amount of sexual abuse that a lot of people endure is much more than I ever thought. I mean, studies vary between one in four women and sometimes one in six men have been sexually abused in their lives. And th the messages that we send them is that they're damaged good, that in fact because someone has forced this on them, that they have now forfeited any idea or any future of having a close, intimate sexual relationship with their spouse. Uh, and that, that seems to me almost opposite of the grace of what is offered to us through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Whether or not um, that uh, our first sexual experience was gained through, uh, through our own sin or through the sinful actions of others and us being innocent victims, um, there are consequences to premarital as well as uh, extramarital uh, sexuality. There's no question about that. And we don't need to pretend like those don't exist. But we also have to be very careful that for those that, are, uh, that, that, that have undergone these traumatic experiences, that they can understand that uh, that does not preclude them from having a wonderful, intimate relationship with their spouse. Interesting that you have written on subjects like this, including modesty and the objectification of women 
vis-a-vis -vis human value. And what I found particularly interesting in your perspective is that you point out to your children, particularly to your sons, if I recall correctly, that the idea in terms of mitigating objectification is not necessarily to try to keep boys or men from looking away, but rather change the way you look. In other words, change your perception of what you're looking at from simply skin and shape and form to a holistic view of what you're looking at. Yeah, I, I, that's exactly it, Hank. When it came to uh, the article about the, the, the concept of modesty, uh, I, I do like to challenge some uh, preconceived notions that we have. And most of what I read says it's, it's actually, it's certainly not the fault of women that, that men lust, but women can help us kind of weak men by covering themselves out and getting rid of all of their form, regardless of the environment, regardless of the situation uh, that they're in. And I find that a little bit um, degrading towards men. Um, what we really are looking for is to be able to look at other human beings and treat other humans as intrinsically valuable uh, image bearers of our God. And that really shouldn't make a difference regardless of what they're wearing. So what I try to teach my boys and teach all my children and to model ourselves is regardless of what someone is wearing, regardless of what they look like, to treat them as intrinsically valuable. We have a culture that objectifies, especially objectifies women, that uses images of women to sell things all the time, uses sexually attractive women in order to sell items, and basically treat women and tell them that their value is based on how they look. We make a mistake in the church when we think the answer to that is instead of like cover women up because they are intrinsically scary and, and they will cause you to sin if you actually look at any aspects of skin on their bare midriff or, or whatever that is. And that is the best way that we can combat lustful thinking in our men. The best way to, con is to, to combat lust is, which is, which is uh, by definition, objectifying someone for your own gratification, to use them as an instrument of tool for what goes on in your mind, is to treat them like a full human being, um, to treat them and to reevaluate them as someone who is valuable and, and, and special and precious, um, and not simply something that we need to look away and be fearful of. Uh, what do you make of this whole uh, Harvey Weinstein saga where, on the one hand, you have this moral outrage that I see even in conservative talk shows uh, with respect to his behavior, and rightly so, but the same moral outrage is oftentimes, uh, <laughs> I think, maybe tarnished by the very things that we see, I mean, you, you had this moral outrage, and then you have Howard Stern being, or Snoop Dogg, or you know, being glorified as icons in our culture, legitimate icons. Uh, Hugh Hefner, another great example of someone who's been lionized. And so the moral outrage seems to be very duplicitous to me. In some ways, it is. I see the Harvey Weinstein issue uh, to seeing the horrible abuse as a way that we can say, look inside the magnifying glass of how the culture has treated women and make sure that we're not following some of the same assumptions. Um, over those years, when he was getting away with all of that horrific behavior, there's kind of a, an attitude of like, well, boys will be boys. He's the one who has the power. He's the one who, you know, we just, he is, he, men, are, men are who they are. And if, if any man had that much power, this is the way they would act. So we excuse that behavior. And it's not just Hollywood, of course. We've had issues with Fox News um, and, 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 and the, the CEO of Uber. Um, this has been a really good way for us to look inside and evaluate how we have treated uh, women in the past um, and, and to see how we have accepted the idea that this is simply the way that men are and the way that men think. I think especially coming from a Christian standpoint, and even notwithstanding some of the, the scandals that have happened within Christendom in terms of sexual abuse and, and those that have gone way too far in abusing their power, 
um, we can use this as a way to look back and say, how are we actually treating those around us? Are we showing the true love of Christ around those um, by saying that we need to be different, um, not just in the way that we, uh, we, we protect ourselves, but also in the way that we view other people, other you know, women that are made in the image of God. And I think that's an important thing for us to say, not just accept that this is the way God made men and that's, you know, we've got to deal with it. Instead, we need to evaluate and look at things a little bit differently. And I think, too, there's the added component that women have to be valued in every stage of their life. And so often uh, we're perfectly down with or good with a baby who is a female baby being aborted, sliced up and the parts sold. Of course, it's true with males as well, but following the narrative— and uh, women who have Down syndrome or female babies who have Down syndrome being aborted. In other words, I think there's a sense in which human life has been devalued, period. And when that happens, of course you're going to find this epidemic of devaluing women, objectifying women and the like. Uh, absolutely, I agree with you, Hank. It's really tragic that, uh, you know, in this country we see abortion as, as, a, as a woman's right, and abortion rights as advancing the cause of women. But in other countries, even here, but especially in, in many places like China and India, there's no question that the number of abortions that are done are much greater on little girls, on, 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 on women, on girl embryos, than on boy embryos or, or fetuses. Um, that the, the idea of sex selection abortion is very, very common in a lot of areas of the world. And simply this thing that is seen as a wonderful human right and women's rights here in the, in the West um, is, is used as a means to abort others. And as far as Down syndrome, like I said, I, I said before, we have this really, uh, really strange cognitive dissonance. We have the ability now, um, technologically, to diagnose some of these early diseases, even in the womb. Um, and, but we treat them and act in a very different way. I just read three days ago in the New York Times, they had a, uh, an article about fetal surgery, a new type of fetal surgery. They're using endoscopes to, uh, to fix spina bifida injuries on kids as young as 23 weeks gestation. So, in other words, we're taking medical technology, diagnosing these kids with this, this illness, and surgically repairing them as early as possible in order to have the best results when, um, as, as they continue to develop. But we also use prenatal technology to uh, diagnose Down syndrome. But what we do that for is, unfortunately, to kill maybe as many as 80 to 90% of those who are diagnosed with Down syndrome. We treat that by killing them at the same level of development as the children undergoing fetal surgery. So the idea that we value human life uh, in some instances where we'll just, you know, go to the nth degree to try to fix them, which is wonderful, and at the same time using the same type of technology in order to uh, kill the undesirables, the ones that are, uh, that are going to be more challenging, the ones that are, that are not going to be valued as much, is a real indicator of where we are in our culture. Yeah, I read some chilling articles about Iceland. And the reason I thought that the articles were chilling is that the narrative in the articles was very much uh, related to the notion that Iceland has become very, very progressive and advanced, and uh, they've developed a fantastic culture in which now virtually 100% of all Down syndrome babies are aborted. And again, the narrative is, that's a wonderful thing. That's progress. It's advancement. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that how we treat those in the very beginning of life, in the very end of life, um, in, in terms of uh, how we value them, is a great indicator of where our culture is. The idea that we have an entire country that is known for being able to wipe out or er eradicate uh, this disease, which is normally is a good thing that we eradicate disease, um, but they're not eradicating the disease. What they're doing is they're, they're intentionally killing those who happen to be uh, affected by such disease. And that, that can't be seen as progress. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you're in Michigan. My mother lives in Michigan. 
and she's now in assisted living. She's 92 years of age, and I mean, she's got some issues now. She's got dementia, and yet I remember my dad, before he died, talking about the fact that every single moment we have on this earth, irrespective of our condition, is valuable. Uh, He died of a fibrosing in the lungs that encroached upon his ability to assimilate oxygen. And uh, it was sort of an agonizing death. And I remember when he was in the midst of the agony asking him, wouldn't you sometimes just want to go home and be with the Lord? And i never forget what he told me. He said, Hank, no, every single moment is precious. And it certainly turned out that way as my dad blessed every a single one of his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren as well, on his deathbed, and then went home to be with the Lord. And my mother has the same kind of impact on my kids. My kids are absolutely in love with her. They honestly don't care that much about whatever malady she might have. She has a significant impact on them as the matriarch of our particular family. And so These end-of-life issues that you allude to are very important as well. Oftentimes, you you just want to get rid of them uh, in a nursing home, not see them. And the reason I say oftentimes is because I go into those places and find out that the people in those places are incredibly lonely because their family no longer visits them. And this is another indication of devaluating human life made in the Imago Dei, in the image and likeness of God. Absolutely, Hank. I mean, there's a couple things that come to mind, especially that. The idea of of euthanasia that has been increasing, especially in the European countries, where it started out as, you can see the, the, the progression as it goes down the slippery slope. It started out as a way to be compassionate towards those who are there in chronic pain, and eventually, and almost inevitably, goes to those that are simply burdens to their family. And an answer to that burden is to simply uh, have a physician actively give them medication that will, that, that, that will end their lives. Um, and, but I do think, too, that as, as Christians that we should evaluate, you know, my, my, I have a, my father-in-law right now is, pretty, is, is fairly sick, and uh, he's at home, and, and, uh, but he needs a lot of help to be taken care of. And I think it's important for us that as we view uh, the end-of-life issues, and especially we, we, we fight against uh, those that'll artific- that want to artificially end, um, uh, end the lives of those that are considered burdensome, that we also look at ourselves and say, how are we treating those around us that are considered disabled, that are considered, uh, you know, that are considered burdensome, and uh, ensuring that we are doing what we can to treat others as valuable regardless of the fact of whether or not they can interact like they once did or they have more cognitive issues than they they once had uh, is is very, very important. And I think uh, that's another uh, area in which the blessings that we receive and our families receive from treating those close to us as valuable, um, it's hard to overstate them. And you, you uh, I think we'll see even more as our kids get older. Yeah. Um, another issue which you put your finger on is the ethics of plastic surgery. This, of course, is oftentimes talked about, as you say in the subhead, as self-esteem that comes from a scalpel. But in the article, you make a distinction between reconstructive surgery and cosmetic surgery. And I'd like you to elaborate on that a little bit for those listening in. Yeah, sure. Um, Reconstructive surgery is an attempt to uh, basically reconstruct the part of the body that has been ravaged by some form of disease. You know, for instance, reconstructing a breast after a, a mastectomy would be considered reconstructive surgery. You're, you're repairing, you're trying to replace uh, what has been lost. Um, whereas cosmetic surgery, especially cosmetic surgery, is uh, in, in, in many instances are a way to enhance what we already have. In other words, there's nothing wrong with, with the wrinkles of my face. I simply want to look younger by enhancing my my looks by undergoing a surgical procedure. And even in then, I think that when it comes to cosmetic surgery, we can also subdivide that in a couple different ways. That, you know, for instance, for someone who has a a large birth defect or has a a birthmark or something that makes them uh, out of the ordinary, 
Um, having that repaired in a very cosmetic manner is different than having a you know perfectly uh, functional body that you just are not happy with, uh, with with how it looks and undergoing a surgical procedure in order to enhance that. Yeah, so pretty nuanced issue. There are times in which reconstructive surgery makes sense. You gave an example of that. Uh, and certainly also times in which cosmetic surgery can be perfectly acceptable within a biblical worldview. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think so. I, I think it's, uh, it's, we need to evaluate the situation and, frankly, oftentimes evaluate uh, our heart motives for, doing, for, for, for undergoing procedures. Uh, the concern that I had in terms of even pure cosmetic surgery, and in, if you look at many of the websites that are, that are advertising cosmetic surgery, what they promise is that you are going to have much higher self-esteem, that you are going to feel far better about yourself, if you can only change the way that you look. And that, once again, goes back to how we value each other, that you're going to be much more highly valued by those around you if you look a certain way or you are more closer to the ideal of, of norm. And, and in my research, I found that studies did not show that that really was the case, that, in fact, um, for those that have, have undergone procedures, um, they tend to be uh, dissatisfied with them and the, the amount of dissatisfaction they've had with how their body has changed irreversibly um, actually oftentimes thought that led them to seek other surgeons and other procedures in order to gain this wonderful self-esteem boost uh, that they thought they would get. Um, and I think that's, we, we need to be careful about that, that are we looking at ourselves and esteeming ourselves uh, based on our creator, or are we uh, truly wanting to go through a, a surgical procedure in order to treat um, our, our psychological aspect of our esteem? I want you to talk about something else here for a moment. You mentioned earlier and on in the podcast that you were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. As you know, I have mantle cell lymphoma. Oftentimes when you go through struggles physically, there's always this tendency to want to ask the why question. Why did this have to happen to me? I mean, all of a sudden I have this, this rare disease. I've been healthy for 66 years of my life, and now I have this rare disease, and I have to deal with that as, as part of my job. It's become a part-time job to go to the hospital for this, that, or the other thing. And, 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 and so every now and then that why question creeps in and and I've often told people, at least academically, you can't always get an answer to the why question. You gotta trust God in the midst of your whys. But the tendency is still to think, why in the world do I have to undergo this kind of suffering? And yet when you go through it, you sort of intuitively know why, because it really reorients your thinking and allows you to reorient your life around the divine. Oh, I think that's so true, Hank. And I, I'm very hesitant towards uh, romanticizing the idea of suffering because, uh, you know, suffering is real. And for those that are undergoing medical, medical situations or sometimes even more difficult for those that have had family members and children that undergo uh, very challenging medical situations, that suffering is absolutely real and it's hard and it's brutal. Um, at the same time, uh, it is amazing to see how God can work through those situations, um, through the challenges of, of my life. Frankly, my, my diabetes not being one of the even the greater challenges. Um, there's no question that we can be molded into a a, a, a more sensitive, more empathetic, uh, more loving uh, person um, through all of that. And it's important. That's not to say that it's not extremely, very, extremely difficult. And, um, and I, my heart goes out to those that are, that are struggling, that are st through uh, medical problems and, and things that are extremely painful, both with those themselves or those that, that they, they love. Um, but at the same time, especially looking backwards on those aspects of my life, um, you can see God working through them in ways that are truly mysterious, um, that, that will mold us into making us uh, better people if we allow them to do that. But it's also hard. It's difficult. In this life, you'll have trouble, but take heart. 
as Jesus said, I've overcome the world. You're a surgeon on the one hand. You're also an incredible apologist on the other. And in that vein, perhaps as we start closing out the podcast, it might be good for you to talk to people about a culture in decline, and yet a culture that can be redeemed if Christians will exercise their job description. So often we look at the world and we say, uh, the world is pagan, and we can point out all the problems with paganism. But as I've often said on the Bible Answer Man broadcast, pagans are exercising their job description. What else would they do? The question seems to be, why are Christians not exercising the job description to be Christ's ambassadors, making his way and his will made manifest in a lost and searching world? Maybe that's my way of getting you to talk about the significance of apologetics, the significance of Christians making a difference while there is yet an opportunity to do so in our culture. I, I think it's, a, it's actually a very fantastic point, and I think as Christians we tend to look at the world and we can see the degradation that is going on around us, and our response can be despair, our response can be, you know, just, Lord, let's just end this and, and, and take us up now. Um, and I think both of those are wrong. I think that we have to, number one, evaluate what we're doing. We can look at, at our own lives, and are we, are we loving each other as, as, as Christ would love us? Are we showing those values to the world around us? Are we being different in that way? And I think evaluating those and not just going along with, uh, with, with what seems the expediency of the cultural norms, I think is very important for us. And being able to be equipped to express the answers that God has allowed us to have ourselves in a way which not only makes sense, but also reveals the, the love that we have for other people in our hearts is, is very, very important. We should not be despairing. Uh, we should be people that people see like there's something going on there that is different. And that type of difference is what I want to be involved in. Instead of us sharing the same anxieties that we have as the culture seems to go down um, in, in, in the wrong way. And I think we also have to be careful about being too uh, romantic about the old days, too, um, that, that the, the problems that humans have, have had to deal with, they're different now, and in some ways they're more exposed. But sin is something that we've always had to deal with, and the answer to sin has never changed um, as far as getting forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And being able to explain that in a way that, uh, you know, uh, Acting as though we are beggars who found a loaf of bread and we want to share it with others is, I think, the attitude that we should be having. Absolutely. And Christ not only came to save us by his death, but he came so that we might have life that is life to the full. And uh, so often we just think of the Christian faith as being transactional as opposed to transformational. I'm wondering as we come to a close here, if there's anything that comes to mind that you would like to share with our audience, something that is a passion that you have or a point that you want to make or something that you feel will edify those listening in. Well, yeah, I, I think that the, the number one uh, I guess theory or theme of, of, of my writing is, you know, how we value human beings, uh, be it through abortion or through, uh, through how we act, uh, treat others in, in terms of object, not objectifying them, uh, how we treat those that are disabled, you know, to look at do we value each other based on the fact that we are human beings made in the image of God. And that means that we have quirks, that we have individual uh, uh, individual characteristics that sometimes make it challenging, but are we treating others in that in that right way, or do we treat others as we uh, we uh, complain that the world treats them as merely instrumentally valuable, as important or valuable to us only if we're getting something back from them, if only we see them valuable or so they have some kind of a quality that we seem as positive. Um, when Christ came, he was. Uh, he did not come uh, in, a, in, a, in a means that would uh, make him seem valuable. He came very humbly. 
And I think that should be the attitude that we should be having when we treat other people the right way. And I hopefully that, that as we apply that to all of these sometimes diverse and complex issues, that, that we can still apply that principle in the correct way. On behalf of the Christian Research Institute, I uh, want to thank you for the enormous contributions you've made to our organization uh, through your writing for the Christian Research Journal, through this podcast now, through the Bible Answer Man broadcast that we've done together. Deeply grateful for the excellence of your work. Oh, it's such an honor to talk to you, Hank, and I'm, I'm so... Uh... Just to give a plug, the work that you do, uh, both with the Bible Answer Man and, and through the, the Christian Research Journal, you know, you asked me about my, my desire of apologetics. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention is that when I got a hold of that journal uh, during my, my faith journey and, and read the articles and thought, wow, there's others that are, that are deep thinking about these tough issues and can apply them to the life in the church. It's been such an important part of my life uh, long before I started writing. Um, so I certainly welcome others to uh, also investigate that and see what kind of impact it can have in their lives. Richard Poupard, he is a surgeon. He's also a man who has a tremendous amount of expertise in the field of Christian apologetics, longtime contributing writer, as you've just heard, to the Christian Research Journal. And if you have not subscribed to the Christian Research Journal, there is a way to remedy that woeful condition you can go to the web at equip.org and you can subscribe in a safe, secure fashion. Uh, of course, the Hank Unplugged podcast is a fairly new endeavor on the part of the Christian Research Institute. We've done some very, very interesting shows. You can find them on the web at equip.org or wherever you consume your favorite podcasts. iTunes is a great place to go. And uh, rate this podcast. Uh, subscribe. Share. Review, all of these ways are ways in which you can get this message out to an ever-broadening audience. As always, we're deeply appreciative to those who support the ministry of the Christian Research Institute, the Bible Answer Man broadcast, the Hank Unplugged podcast, our ministries 24-7 around the world. Thanks for joining us on this particular edition of Hank Unplugged. We look forward to seeing you next time with more of the podcast.